And then we decided to go off to China and be English teachers. Being in China and struggling to find coffee, it was kind of out of desperation. That was, that was one of the turning points. What are some reasons that coffee in China should be important? When I switched from Folgers Coffee Crystals, how did you get into, uh, into starting a coffee company? 20% of the world's population that's drinking coffee for the first time. A lot of us, when we bring a new product or a new culture into a place, mm. we make the mistake of trying to change their thinking. Welcome to Bean Stuff. Today on the podcast, we have a guest with us. Who do we have on the podcast today, Dad? We have Adam Carpenter. Looking forward to Adam today. Wow. Adam Carpenter, you're a uh, born in Michigan. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you were uh, an entrepreneur who stumbled into coffee. What did you do before coffee? And how did you stumble into coffee? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't take the time to actually count how many different jobs I had before getting into coffee, but I grew up on a farm in Michigan, and um, just through growing up, working, going to school, meeting a beautiful woman that I fell in love with, mm -hmm. we got married, and then we decided to go off to China and be English teachers. I had, I had been a coffee drinker before that, mm -hmm. and it was really in being in China and struggling to find coffee. It was kind of out of desperation that I just thought, man, I can't find any good coffee over here. Yeah, that was that was one of the turning points. We actually launched a coffee company over there, but that's a different story. You know, I should backtrack a little bit. Uh, before going to China, I actually had the chance on a cross-cultural study tour mm. to go down to Guatemala and Costa Rica. And so it was there that we learned about history and religion and family and education. And we spent a few days living on a farm, picking coffee wow. beans during wow. during the day, picking coffee cherries and then playing football, playing soccer at night hmm. with the kids, you know? Yeah. And so it was there that I kind of had this realization that coffee is an agricultural product. Mm. So for a farm boy growing up, working on the farm with my dad and my grandpa and my family and my cousins, uh, I saw that coffee is close to the earth. And so that that was, I think, when I switched from Folgers Coffee Crystals to like <laughs> requiring that I drink something real that came from the ground yeah. you know, that hadn't been manufactured. You you got into coffee. You got into out of some of this desperation to find uh, find good coffee, not just instant stuff. <laughs> um, now, specifically in China, how did you get into uh, into starting a coffee company? Uh, that was a seed that was planting planted in me in college, mm. and then it was later when I was in China, and I kind of got tired of teaching English because mm. I was a business graduate. Uh, I didn't want to teach people to say, hello, thank you, how are you, fine, and you, <laughs> you know, it was just the same kind of tedium. Mm. And uh, one of my friends who was also teaching English, he used to roast coffee. He was from Michigan, and he had experience roasting coffee. So I said, well, I speak a little Chinese, and I, I have an MBA thinking I can, you know, start a business. You go to MBA school, and you can do anything, right? <laughs> exactly. All I needed was a coffee roaster, and so here he was. Yeah. And so the two of us kind of put our heads together and that's what that's what got us started in China. After going through some of that in China and then starting the coffee company and working in coffee in China, what for you, what are some reasons that coffee in China should be important to kind of the rest of the coffee uh, world? You know, there's a lot of unknown about China, but everyone always thinks it's this huge population that's far away across the ocean. Mm -hmm. Or across the landmass if you're listening in Europe, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um the interesting thing about China, though, is it's a nation. It's this huge nation, you know, 20 percent of the world's population that's drinking coffee for the first time. And it's also they have a huge landmass and they're growing coffee for the first time. Hmm. And so I think what's happening over in China is really exciting just to help uh, add to the coffee culture that we already have. Yeah. And so you have all these fresh coffee drinkers who have a different palate. They have a different taste preference. They have different growing styles and um and i think we should care because any of us who are drinking coffee it's going to make coffee more scarce there's mm. more people in the world who are going to be buying it right? right or for the farmers who are growing it uh, hopefully it's going to increase the demand mm -hmm. like that would be a great thing if mm -hmm. it could increase price for the farmers and then for those of us who are actually in the business and we're roasting and selling I think we're going to get a lot of innovations that are going to come from the other side of the ocean. Well, and it's interesting, something you brought up there is the growing coffee in China. China is kind of this, you know, it's a country that's more industrialized than a lot of other countries like Ethiopia and 
Brazil and different places like that, mm -hmm. the culture around starting to grow coffee and coffee farms in a more industrialized uh, civilization. What is that? Is that very different? Yeah, that's a that's a, a keen insight because you know we look at Ethiopia, we look at the mm. birthplace of coffee, and they've been growing for thousands of years or over yeah. a thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And then some of these nations that have been uh, cultivating and learning probably slowly and through mm. uh, passing on through families and through craft. Mm. So in China, what's exciting for them to be doing this for the first time is that they have the internet. They have the access to, hmm. you know, consultants and PhDs and specialty coffee uh, leaders all over the world. They can fly them in. Mm -hmm. They've got the money. Mm -hmm. They've got the motivation. Wow. So what they're able to do in 5, 10, 15 years probably took you know, Brazil, hundreds of years to accomplish, <laughs> yeah. just in terms of mm -hmm. learning and fermentation and growing mm. and agriculture. And then, like you said before, they're a commercialized nation, mm. a, a manufacturing nation. So they've got the roads, the infrastructure, the ports, the warehouses, they've got everything already in place that they can, they can set up what we need for storage and shipping and getting this out to the world much faster and easier than other less developed nations or less wealthy nations could. Mm. So the speed of development and they are motivated to develop is, uh, it's really incredible over there. I've been to, I think with you and a, a Chinese cupping of coffee, what's that like? What's it taste like? So the coffee in China, the interesting thing is that a lot of old tea farms are, are being uprooted and turned into coffee land. What's it taste like? Interesting a, a descriptor we use in coffee is tea-like, right? <laughs> tea, we, we have tea-like in the aroma or in the body and even some of the flavor notes. And and I do think there is a tea-like uh, hmm. quality mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. um, some of the black teas and green teas both. I might suggest that that has to do with roasting as well. You yes, know, I think if, you're right. If, yeah. If you're light roasting and you get those chlorogenic acids and some of those green uh, tea-like flavors come out of it. Yeah. But uh, in a general term, um, most of the coffee in China is grown in Yunnan province, mm. uh, which means southern clouds, Y-U-N-N-A-N. -N. And when you're looking at China, sort of where is that on the map? China's a big country. Right. That's the that southwest uh, Golden Triangle, okay. kind mm -hmm. of. So you're pressing down toward Myanmar and Thailand and okay. mm -hmm. Vietnam, mm -hmm. you know, and, they, and they're growing coffee down there too. Mm -hmm. Very similar profiles. If you look at the Arab mm. Arabica from Myanmar and Laos and hmm. Thailand, so uh, but it's it's noted by high sweetness, high acidity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, careful with the processing, careful with the roasting, so that the acidity is pleasant and sweet, mm -hmm. not uh, overpowering. Mm. A lot of the coffee that's grown there, um, and I think a lot of the reason why we're getting a innovation coming out of there is the catamore species. And so the the catamore being, um, you know, closely in strand to the robusta plant, it's quite disease resistant. Mm -hmm. It's quite strong. It's good. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it has some of those chlorogenic and uh, higher caffeine levels. Hmm. So learning how to roast and grow that in a new region with different types of rainfall, different types of weather and patterns, um, you know, it is an experiment in process as well, trying to figure out how to process and roast this coffee best for the world and for our enjoyment. And are people bringing in different types of coffee to try growing in China? Yeah. In the beginning, uh, I forget how much of it was uh, naturally growing there. There were mm. some species that were growing in Southeast or Southwest Asia there. Mm. Um, so they have been bringing in increasingly you know, bourbons and geishas and yeah. katuras and tipicas. And they're trying to, they're trying to expand that, but not always, you know, a lot of times the plant is suited for certain climates and regions and soil types. Mm. And yeah. so struggling to find that perfect plant for the, for the new environment is also a challenge. But we were talking earlier about innovation. Mm. And I think one of, one of the greatest challenges that they have in innovation is you know, part of it is the farmer education and a lot that's happening at the growing processing level. 
part of it is just waiting long enough for the plants to mature. Mm. You know, you got to wait three or three or four years before you're picking coffee cherries <laughs> off of a tree. Right. And so when when China's only 10, 15 years into this process, really, <laughs> right. you know, they've wow. only gone through a couple iterations of planting and yeah. they're kind of just sitting around waiting for the trees to grow. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're learning and bringing in consultants at the same time. I remember capping with you um, being pleasantly surprised is probably the word to say that there was I can't remember there was six eight different coffees on the table and one or two of them thought oh yeah whatever that's, mm-hmm. that's fine but I remember a couple going that, that piques my interest I mm-hmm. that, that's got some like you were saying the the sweetness and the clear clarity of the um, acidity uh, but I particularly my first thought I think you've mentioned this before too that this would work well in a blend we're getting sort of technical talking about different varieties of coffees and so forth in China Mm-hmm. If you went to have a cup of coffee, where would you go? What would you do? So I lived in central China, and uh, most of Chinese people live in the eastern, southeastern part. That's just kind of where the water flows. If you mm. look at a map, the landmass of China is about the size of uh, the United States minus Alaska. <laughs> and so it would be like pushing everyone down into, uh, you know, Illinois. Uh, from Illinois down to Florida. It's kind of like that southeastern part. Like 1.3 billion people pushed into the corner of the states. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, uh, right in the center of that is kind of where the rivers intersect, Wuhan. Uh, People call it like a uh, Chicago Hmm. of China. It's kind of a port city, trade city on the river. Um, It took us a while before we got our our Starbucks proliferated around there. Mm -hmm. And Mm. McDonald's McCafe has done a really good job as well. Wow. Uh, KFC now has uh, huh. their big push. And a lot of the Chinese push in coffee is uh, Xian Mo Cafe, which is fresh ground coffee. Like that's kind of how they market it, mm. which is I think it's that modern understanding. This is not the instant coffee bag you used to drink. This is a fresh ground coffee. Mm. Yeah. And so that's like the term specialty or in, in America, we say 100 percent Arabica. You know, that's yes. kind of a catchphrase. So you can go to a restaurant, you can go to the street corner in a shopping mall and, and get it. But it's increasingly popular to combine a little bookstore hmm. or a plant shop, you know, like succulent plants or cut flowers. Yeah. Um, what else? Just some of these little boutique stores, people are people are trying to put in coffee like hmm. as a hobby, hmm. kind of a business, to, a place to have meetings. Hmm. Uh, having meetings and meeting your friends is really important. And that's really what coffee is in China and um, has been viewed as from the beginning is a reason to meet, Mm. not as a daily caffeine intake. The first thing you get in the morning, like a lot of cafes will open at 11 a.m. because people aren't worried about meeting their friends and having a business meeting until, you know, it's close to the lunch hour. And a lot of cafes are busier in the afternoons and evenings Mm. than they are in the mornings. Mm. So it's, it's anywhere that you can meet and have a productive conversation. And some sometimes it's the little bookstore or the corner craft shop or a postcard shop, mm. you know, where you're selling kind of some handmade goods. Yeah. It sounds like people aren't consuming maybe as much of coffee as we would maybe stateside or, or mm-hmm. other places. Is it hard to, I guess, is it you're changing people's mindset on what coffee is in a sense? When we first started, I think a lot of, a lot of us, when we bring a new product or a new culture into a place, Mm. We make the mistake of trying to change their thinking, change mm. their behavior towards something. Yeah. Right? So we drink coffee every day in America or twice a day. You know, we, we're at the coffee shop. So we want to teach you how to do that. Mm. And you actually find yourself fighting against culture, which is a really... What we had to try to do was understand the Chinese taste, what kind of coffees and roasting do mm. they prefer. The Chinese needed to meet, right? They needed a meeting point more than they needed a cup of coffee. Interesting. And often when they're meeting, they're going to be sitting there for 90 minutes. And so they really need food. And Mm. so food and the type of food that you serve them is really essential. They don't want muffins and cookies and sandwiches. They (laughs) like so many cafes serve plates of spaghetti with bolognese sauce. I like the sound of this. (laughs) And then lattes and mochas, you know. (laughs) Wow. And the the Chinese aren't drinking it black. If they drink black coffee, it's just Americano Mm -hmm. because... Because it has a good name, and they see it in the movies, and people drink Americanos. But hmm. they drink milk coffees, and um, and they typically they need good seating, hmm. not like 
bar style seating or you know we like these refurbished buildings with brick and it's kind of cold they want warm huh. so that's one of the reasons starbucks did really well they have their dark woods and it's generally a warm feeling mm-hmm. and, Interesting. and it really met that chinese need to meet people and have a warm safe place predictable wi-fi mm-hmm. bathrooms like there are just critical things that you have to have in place and if you don't get those right you're fighting <laughs> against that culture we had talked about the before we recorded the podcast about like the tonality of just the language itself Mm -hmm. was it hard like when you're doing marketing or anything like that to get the right marketing because i would assume that you could easily say the wrong thing fairly quickly interesting story so uh you can read business case studies you know there's Mm -hmm. lots of fun blogs about how businesses choose a chinese name and so uh, you know you think about names that work really well and that stick and in a nation like china the duplication of sounds or even duplication of words. So uh, like when, when Paul was a child, we would probably call him Paul Paul. Like you, you duplicate it and it hmm. softens it. Mm-hmm. Like, like a baby or a child talk, you soften things. And so even with names like uh, Coca-Cola mm. was just one of the classic names where it was Coca-Cola. Mm. And K-K-Cola translated really well into monosyllabic Chinese. You know, they have the single syllable per word. So it was four characters, k ko thirsty mouth, k la uh, thirsty happy. Mm. Wow. And so, and actually the second k might be wrong. I need to check those notes. I'm on the fly here. <laughs> <It's cool. laughs> I don't know. You're but you, you two aren't going to correct me on no. my Chinese. Right? <laughs> and so... Um, and so then, you know, there's these other companies that just really fail. Hmm. Like, uh, I think it was, um, was it Best Buy? Uh, buy Sure, Buy Sure Buy. They translated something that sounded like Best Buy. Hmm. I'm pretty sure it was Best Buy. Mm-hmm. And it was like 100 tries to purchase. Ooh. <laughs> and so you don't want to tell something like you need to try this a hundred times before you're going to buy. Right. And, um, you know, there are other times when like you can cross a cultural taboo mm. just because your name sounds like that. And so you actually have to adopt something that sounds totally different. Like Starbucks is Xin Ba Ke. Well, Ba Ke has no meaning. It just mm. sounds like bucks. But Xin is the translation for star. Hmm. So it's it's like this combination. Anyway, I said all of that because we had to try to choose our name, and our name was Rock, R-O-C-C. Mm. And so Rock, we initially tried to translate like the meaning of rock or a foundation, and that was part of our Chinese name. But all of our Chinese friends just created their own Luo Ke, Luo Ke, which had no meaning, but it was easy for them to say, mm-hmm. and they just started using it. And so we ended up with a name that we didn't even choose. It was just really? it was just what all the young people were saying and how they referenced it and how our salespeople would introduce the company. Wow. And so it sticks. And you kind of you have to have that fluidity, mm. sometimes understanding, sometimes to be careful, but sometimes just to go with it. Like yeah. we yeah. didn't even get to choose our name in Chinese, wow. but <laughs> it came together. <laughs> wow. And I we were reading through some of your uh, blog posts and different things and we were uh, I can't remember if we saw it from there or somewhere, but you had bought a, a Dietrich roaster mm-hmm. oh, from yes. L.A. while you were in China mm-hmm. and had it shipped across to China, mm-hmm. and it ended up working out really well, it sounded like. Yeah. Um, what was that process like? Yeah. That's our number one blog post. Really? Like, that's really? <laughs> the, so, so for anyone who's looking for a good internet hack, this is totally off topic, so, <laughs> but if like people are searching the internet all the time for a used coffee roaster... And mm. Diedrich would be second after Probat, probably. Mm-hmm. And so well, I get so much traffic to the website from that one blog post. And then people are probably so disappointed because I'm not selling roasters. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was a great story to tell because um, that summer we were kind of getting to the tipping point of when do we launch? You know, let's raise some money. We need a roaster. Mm. And so I had been scanning Craigslist for months and found a Diedrich that came for sale. It was down in Tempe, Arizona. And at that time, we were, my wife and I had started a nonprofit and we were sending English teachers to China. Mm. And so one of our teachers that we recruited was in Arizona. Mm-hmm. I think it was in Phoenix, which wasn't far from Tempe. And I, I emailed him and I said, hey, would you go kick the tires on this thing and make sure it works? I'm about to buy it, sight unseen. <laughs> 
and I was in Michigan at the time. Okay, wow. And so then he went and sent me these videos, and by that time I had already flown back to China, and so I said, "Let's do it. Wire the guy, wire the guy money." And so we bought it, wow. shipped it, and yeah, it was it was so smooth. Uh, Twenty days from shipment wow. to my door in central wow, china that's good hmm. other than the giant train crane truck they brought this crane that could have moved like a mobile home <laughs> and it's just this little roaster on a crane i mean 12 kg roaster it's pretty heavy it's, but it's yeah they brought this industrial crane out that i spent like a thousand bucks to move the thing to my door <laughs> it was the worst part and when you we're starting this into coffee. What, what was said was harder? Was it harder with the business side of things, like doing all that business in China, or was it harder, more like the training side to get the people behind you to run the business or to to have those things run smoothly? Was it yeah, either the people or was it was it more the business side that was more difficult? The business always cost, and you always need to budget twice as much as you expect, mm. right? And things always take twice as long as you plan. Mm. And so, I would say one of the, one of just the ongoing and continual challenges we had was financial. Mm. And, um, you know, you would budget for as much as you could, but working in a foreign culture and not knowing the language, you wouldn't realize how much work it was going to be to stay up with the books mm. and to deal with just kind of the financial reporting landscape. Mm. And then once you get that figured out, then there's uh, inspections from the lo local departments and... Uh, you get through those, and then you're dealing with everything else. And then at the end of the month, you're thinking, man, we did, we didn't hit our sales target. You know, we were mm. putting out fires all month. And that's a classic business lesson that we all have to learn, how to prioritize what must be done, how to put out the fires. Uh, I always had great staff who worked for me. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I think that I was, I was often not hands-on enough with them. Mm. So... <clears throat> In Chinese culture, the way they're raised, the way that they're led in school, the way that uh, their employers deal with them is a very hands-on, directive, mm. uh, hard, micromanaging approach, typically. Mm. And I didn't want that. I'm not that kind of person. I'm an American. So a lot of times I gave them too much space, and I think I created a lot of frustration for them. <laughs> so whatever staff difficulties we had came from my own inability to lead them mm. the way they needed to be led. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, financially, and even financially, one of the challenges, again, was we came in in 2000, uh, 2012, we started, and at that point in central China, there was pretty much no one roasting specialty coffee. There were no mm. real handcraft local roasters, and by the time we got a couple years in, there were quite a few, or people were really starting to turn their eyes toward this, Yeah. and when the Chinese move, uh, they can also move with a lot of power and money. You know, we've seen that with their development and everything else. And so uh, we didn't get started fast enough with enough capital to mm. really be ready after a couple of years mm. in. Other people were coming in, making a big noise with mm. a lot of money. So, you know, if you, if, you, if you don't have enough money, you constantly feel that problem. Yeah. I think if you're in a good financial position, then you're aware of every other problem. <laughs> <laughs> like the money never really goes away, but <laughs> yeah. that was always kind of the... The one you wake up to. <laughs> right. And while you're going through all this, you're starting this new company, you're starting out in a new culture, all these different things. What's the, you know, when you're at the low point of the day or the low mm. point of the week, what, what is it that drives you to continue moving forward with what you're doing there? Well, I had great support from my wife. Mm -hmm. And um, relationally, I had great encouragement from the Chinese. Mm. You know, it's it's that's a, that's a culture like so many others where you – live and breathe by your relationships mm. Mm. and not in a bad way, not in a, you know, corner cutting way, but you just, you rely on your friends and your family and your yeah. friends become like your family. Um, the reason we were over there and endured a lot of the pollution and the hardships, uh, my wife and I, we value relationships mm. above finances, right? And we're Christians and we have a faith in God and when you have those hard days and you just can't muster up hope in yourself, mm -hmm. you got to lean into a bigger brain. You got to lead into a higher yeah. power. And so our faith was critical to get us through a lot of those hard moments. And, and we had other people who would support us and pray for us. It, it wasn't that we didn't face hard times. We faced them like everyone else, but we found strength from those relationships and from our faith. And mm -hmm. so you push through. You do. You do. Yeah. <laughs> 
So Adam, what is what is what's next for you? What's your what's your one of your passions for coffee uh, moving forward? I've realized as a theme, going uh, just going over. I'm at a point of transition right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Simon Sinek, uh, discovering your why. Mm-hmm. It's one of the you know what most widely viewed TED talks out there. It's a great book, but. One of his practices is you go through critical moments in your history where you've seen, like, this is where I feel alive, this is where I feel on fire, this is what other people validate. Mm. And I love, and I've always been kind of a part of training, empowering, mobilizing, helping people do something new, right? Yeah. Make a change. I was sending teachers to China. I was recruiting for other things. I loved having staff and building mm. them up. So my last year in China, we we iterated from... Uh, the roaster wholesale to opening a couple cafes and doing retail, selling retail mm. uh, to training. And I became an SCA trainer with the Specialty Coffee Association. Wow. And I loved training. Like that was that was like the highlight. Part of it was I didn't have to manage a staff anymore, which I, I felt like I made a lot of mistakes as mm-hmm. a leader. And um, I learned a lot through that. But training and working with other people, basically all my old customers or even competitors, Mm. I called them up and I said, hey, can I come and train your staff? Like, can we run some courses? You want barista courses? Let's do it. You want sensory courses? Let's do it. Yeah. And so I love training. And um, I left China with, uh, with basically I left all my clients and customers over there. And I realized that training looks very different in America. Hmm. Like we just don't do training like they do in Asia. Mm. Uh, certificates are viewed differently or they're not as critical. Hmm. And um, so what I did was I recorded all of my foundation content and I put it on YouTube and I did, you know, foundation green, foundation roasting, sensory brewing, barista, and just kind of PowerPoint style walkthrough. Mm. And I got all these subscribers from the Philippines and Korea and wow. Russia and uh all over the world not many from america a few from america but (laughs) mostly asia and africa and so i get these people who reach out to me on whatsapp and they're Mm. like man i'm so excited i just i'm about to take a class and you help me prepare and so i get really fired up with training Mm -hmm. and i I, i'd like to do something with that and make it uh make it more accessible to more people Mm. because the barista is a hard position to Mm. to grow a career on I I think in America, it's a much better career, but in most of Asia, most of the world, it's viewed like a a waitress or a waiter, Mm. you know, like really a low, low level waiter or waitress, like Mm. you're washing dishes, or maybe you're just working at McDonald's or in fast food. Mm. And so to elevate that position and to help train and empower people to develop those skills, to take classes and get certified, I'd be really excited Mm. about that. I know a lot of people listening would say, I like the sound of that. Where can I hear that? Is the top of the head, can they just go somewhere to listen to that training of, of that you have there? Mm-hmm. Where would they go? If you if you look up um, SCA Barista Foundation, okay. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. PowerPoint. Yeah. I think I even named it PowerPoint. But on my website, it's mm-hmm. sca.training. Mm-hmm. So not dot com, dot training. Dot training. Um, but yeah, if you search, uh, if you search on YouTube for any of the SCA modules, SCA Green Foundation, mm-hmm. Brewing Foundation, Sensory Foundation. I tell you, I've actually done that already. Mm-hmm. And I was amazed at the, the, the content that was in there. I felt <laughs> like I was, I've done SCA, I've taught at SCA, but I thought, wow, this is, I would say it's more than just getting a, a prepared for an essay. It was like doing the SCA course. It was like, there's a lot of good stuff in there. So I would encourage people to look at that, whatever else they do. But uh, it was very helpful. I actually I actually got called by the SCA last year. Really? And they said, um, <laughs> they said, you know, uh, it's really interesting what you've done. No other trainer has ever put their training online for free. Hmm. And, and these are basically the five classes that I would run and you get 500 bucks a pop per student for doing this. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about kind of protecting your, your space. And Mm -hmm. I don't know how much I should say here because I don't want to make anyone upset, but (laughs) my goal was to make it accessible, especially for people who couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and I was really thinking of my Asian brothers and sisters and, you know, anyway, um, I forget where I was going on that track, but 
It, but the content is there it is. to mm. basically prepare. And so the SEA called me and they said, well, can you just remove some of the proprietary content or the, the worksheets and the different things? And I said, absolutely. You know, mm. And they were, they were actually really supportive. That's great. That's yeah, good to hear. Yeah, I didn't yeah. get in trouble, but they just good. said, can you pull some things down? And so you'll notice on the PowerPoints, there's like white squares or there's some slides deleted. And so that was like <laughs> post SCA phone call. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That's awesome. And we'll put links to that in the description for the podcast yeah. too, because that's an awesome thing for people mm-hmm. that's helpful. to go check out. And it's so cool that it is a free resource. I mean, yeah. Yeah, having this... those is available. Sometimes that can be the differentiator between someone going forward and someone saying, I don't have access to that. I can't go any, any further until I get that money or, you know, whatever right. it might be. And you still have to have access to a machine or to mm-hmm. the sensory right. kit. You still have to do the practical stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. But if you know, at least I'm going to pass the written exam and I and I have a lot of this learning. Yeah. Um, that's that's an empowering tool. But it's not it's not flowery. I mean, you're sitting there listening to me <laughs> read my script. This is basically my class notes. Yeah. You know? It's, that's you all have right. to be a motivated student. Well, I was going to say, I think anyone listening or going to a site like that, right. I think they're already motivated. And you almost don't hear the whatever, how it's portrayed, because you are just soaking up the good content, the stuff there. This is quality. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you don't realize that not everyone's going to perhaps listen to this. But no. no. There's a lot that will. It's a niche. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I guess the question I have is, when people are starting out in the coffee world, what would you recommend they focus their training on? Like, or, I mean, obviously there's a lot to learn. Is there something that you're like, oh, this is what I would start with? You know, I hired a few baristas. Let me tell it through story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, I hired a lot of baristas and those that I had the most difficulty with had mm-hmm. come from other cafes and had a lot of bad habits mm-hmm. and thought they knew what they were doing. And my best, my best baristas, uh, Michelle and her classmate, Shirley, and some others, and even some of my best students mm. were my old English students. Hmm. They, they were English experience. majors or literature <laughs> majors. They were good with people, and they valued communication. Hmm. Okay? And so then they came in as a blank slate. And when I told them, this is how you adjust, this is how you adjust a grinder. Right. And when you go left, it's coarse. And when you go right, it's fine. They didn't screw up. And when they had to, <laughs> when they had to extract an espresso shot... 26 grams within 22 seconds, they did it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. when they had to foam milk, they did it right. And so why do I say that? Uh, a lot of us become fixed minded. Mm. And you know, that fixed mindset mm-hmm. and having an open mindset is totally different. And so anyone who wants to really grow in coffee, I would just uh, tell them to stay hungry, stay learning, open mm. their mind, because it's a huge world and it's constantly changing. Mm-hmm. But at the same world, it's at the same time, it's a huge world that's rooted in these hundreds, over a thousand years of tradition. Yeah. And we've got a lot to learn from other nations, mm-hmm. from all of science. And then uh, if you can expand your coffee palate and get the chance to drink other types of coffees from other places in the world and uh, understand sensory through other people's eyes, mm. you know, you just always got to grow. And so some of the best learners and the best learning that I've seen, they're open to that. Mm. But if you need a topic, I'd say extraction. Like, extraction. go deep on extraction science. Because you can learn sensory, and people say they're not good at sensory. You can learn latte art. And really, if you're just foaming milk, good. Whether it looks great or not, just make <laughs> it feel good in your mouth and taste good. <laughs> yeah. But extraction, hmm. I think that's one of those critical, critical issues that so many people don't understand. Mm. And for the roaster, it would be like... Uh, roasting without introducing roast defects Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. right because you can buy really nice coffee and you can screw it up as a roaster (laughs) because you've got all these bad habits Mm -hmm. you can buy really bad coffee which is what we often did in china because that's all we got and Mm. it was shipped halfway around the world and it was old and stored improperly Mm. so if you can if you can master roasting basics Mm. or you can master extraction basics and those two go go closely together together. Mm. I i think those would be my step one and step two. Mm. You know, if anyone's tuning into, if anyone's tuning into the coffee competitions, like the barista Mm. competitions, roaster competitions, we've seen more and more Asian competitors kind of rising to the stage. I think that's another exciting development we might see in China. Yeah. Uh, There are a few roasters that are brave enough to, to buy Yunnan coffee, Chinese coffee. I'd say it's time. 
anyone who's listening out mm-hmm. there, uh, you know, we could put it in the show notes, but I've definitely yeah. got a great resource. Uh, people who are doing it right at the farm level education. I mean, they're running Q grader courses for farmers pro wow. bono just because they want to build up Chinese farmers. Mm-hmm. Um, so brave roasters are roasting Chinese coffee, trying to make a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time. I mean, I don't want to beat the China card too often because mm. that can get political too. But <laughs> keep growing, stay hungry. We should go out with some Chinese. We should teach Whoa. them a little, right? Yeah, what is, <laughs> yeah, we'll teach us a little bit in Chinese here. All right, so you say goodbye. Yes. Or let's start with hello. Okay, okay. that's been fair enough. Okay, ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Yeah, so you got your ni, right? Yeah. You're yeah. saying hao. hao. Yeah. Ni hao. That's how I probably There you go. <laughs> Thank you. And then, uh, so goodbye. Zai Jin. Zai Jin. Zai. Zai Jin. So when you say uh, soap suds, like S U D S, suds, suds, oh. like that D Z, oh, right. that's a Chinese Z. 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 Zai. Z. Zai. Zai. Jin. Zai Jin. Zai Jin. Zai Jin. Yeah. So ni hao is like this wave mm. tone, and then zai jin is falling sharp. Oh. Interesting. So that's goodbye. Zai Zai Jin. Wow. And that literally means see you again. Wow. It doesn't mean goodbye. It means see you again. See you again. Yeah. I like because that. Because you don't say goodbye in Chinese. You it's say see you again. abrupt. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Rude. So we can close with the uh, Zai Jin. Yeah. See Zai you again. Jin. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You want to try it, Dad? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really nervous now. <laughs> That last uh, episode we did on uh, coffee different, from different worlds, I, I did put a side note saying I am hopeless at translation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Zai Jen. Zai Jen. Zai Jen. <laughs>